Hello, and welcome to this Shoreland Zoning Update. My name is Lynn Markham, and I am the Shoreland Specialist with the University of Wisconsin Extension Center for Land Use Education, located at UW-Stevens Point. The Wisconsin Legislature has made many changes to Shoreland Zoning in the past year, and this three-part video summarizes the changes. This video includes three parts. The first part is an introduction to shoreland zoning and the recent changes to required shoreland lot sizes. The second part is changes to shoreland setbacks, vegetation protection, and impervious surfaces. And the third part is changes to standards for buildings that are located close to the shoreline. The purposes of shoreland zoning include to prevent and control water pollution, to protect spawning grounds, fish, and aquatic life, and to keep the trees, shrubs, and other plants along the shoreline that protect our lakes and streams. We've also learned that shoreland zoning standards protect property values. In lakes with less clear water, waterfront property values are lower. This comes in part from a study of over 1,200 waterfront properties in Minnesota that found when the water was less clear by three feet, Waterfront property values around these lakes went down by tens of thousands to millions of dollars. What shoreland practices make water less clear? Rooftops on buildings and pavement close to the water cause increased runoff that carries pollutants to the lake or stream. We also see increased soil pollution and there's no shoreline buffer in place to filter the runoff before it enters the lake. When shoreland zoning was adopted in 1966 by the Wisconsin Legislature, it set minimum standards, and counties could adopt higher standards as they decided what was best for the lakes and rivers in their counties. Counties continued to make these decisions for over 35 years, until 2015. After shoreland zoning was adopted in the 1960s, more homes and larger homes were built on waterfront lots causing increased impacts to lakes and rivers. As a result of increased waterfront development and new scientific research looking at how waterfront development affects lakes and fish, many counties adopted higher shoreland standards as shown here. In 2015, shoreland zoning in Wisconsin changed. The Wisconsin Legislature passed Act 55, the state budget bill, which stated counties can no longer have shoreland zoning standards that are more restrictive or higher than state standards for any of their lakes and streams. This means that the state minimum standards also became the state maximum standards. Act 55 also included other shoreland zoning changes and became effective July 14, 2015. We've known for decades that the closer a home is to the shoreline, the greater impact it has on the lake or stream. The home shown here was built at the shoreland setback and has a shoreline buffer in place to filter runoff from the roof of the house and provide wildlife habitat. This home is built much closer to the shoreline. As a result, more pollutant carrying runoff enters the lake or stream because the rooftop is close to the water, so there is little time for the runoff to soak into the ground before it enters the water. There is little to no room for a shoreline buffer to hold the soil in place and filter fecal bacteria and nutrients out of runoff. And also there is less shoreline habitat for loons, eagles, frogs, and other animals. The red house shown in this diagram does not meet the shoreland setback because the whole house is not located 75 feet back from the ordinary high, high water mark. There are multiple reasons the house might be located at less than the shoreland setback. The red house could be a non-conforming structure. It could be a structure allowed at less than the setback by variance. It could be a structure allowed at less than the setback through setback averaging. Or it could be a structure that was built illegally without a permit. On the next few slides, I will discuss non-conforming structures and structures allowed at less than the shoreland setback by variances. Then I will describe the changes the Wisconsin Legislature made in 2015 and 2016 to the laws that apply to these structures. First, we'll look at non-conforming structures. In shoreland zoning, a non-conforming structure is a structure that was lawfully placed when constructed 
but does not comply with the current required setback from the ordinary high water mark. Regulating nonconforming structures has always been a careful balancing act between property rights of the owner to keep what they have and limiting expansion and rebuilding close closer to the water than is allowed today for new structures in order to maintain fairness and protect the lakes and rivers. Non-conforming principal structures have always been allowed unlimited maintenance and repair and sometimes limited expansion. Prior to 2015, if a non-conforming structure was destroyed by violent wind, vandalism, fire, flood, or infestation, state law made it clear that the structure could be rebuilt to the same size in the same location. When a non-conforming structure reached the end of its useful life and a new home was proposed, if there was room on the lot to build at the current shoreland setback, this was required, just like for other new homes. Structures may be allowed at less than the shoreland setback by variance if there is no building location on the lot that meets the setback. Shoreland variances are decided on a case-by-case -case basis by the County Zoning Board of Adjustment. The following changes were made in 2015 and 2016 by the Wisconsin Legislature. Non-conforming structures and structures located at less than the shoreland setback by variance can be replaced in their current location if the activity does not expand the footprint. Non-conforming structures and structures located at less than the shoreland setback by variance can also be expanded to 35 feet in height. No approval, fee, or mitigation is required through shoreland zoning for replacement of these structures or vertical expansion. A building permit, general zoning permit, or other permit may be needed, so property owners should check with the county zoning office. For many years, Wisconsin law has included a list of structures that are exempt from the 75-foot shoreland setback. In other words, they don't need to meet that setback. The list includes boathouses that are located above the ordinary high water mark, walkways, stairways, or rail systems necessary to access the shoreline, open-sided and screened structures such as gazebos that are located at least 35 feet back, broadcast signal receivers, utility transmission and distribution lines, poles, towers, well pump house covers, and privately owned wastewater treatment systems, specific fishing rafts, and recently in 2015 and 2016 were added to the list systems used to treat runoff from impervious surfaces and utilities authorized by DNR. These structures that are exempt from the 75-foot setback are represented by the red shapes shown on the slide. In 2015 and 2016, the Wisconsin Legislature made the following changes to structures exempt from the shoreland setback, which includes the full list on the previous slide and is represented by the red shapes shown here. All exempt structures may be replaced within their three-dimensional building envelope with no approval, fee, or mitigation through shoreland zoning. Counties must allow a boathouse above the ordinary high water mark on all waterfront lots. The roof of a flat boathouse may now be used as a deck, no sidewalls or screens. And counties may continue to set standards for the number of boathouses per lot and the square footage per boathouse. Starting in the mid-1990s, Many counties started including mitigation in their shoreland ordinances in order to allow development flexibility in exchange for shoreland stewardship practices. Mitigation is proportional to the building project and it currently applies where property owners are exceeding minimum impervious surface standards and when there is lateral or sideways expansion or relocation of nonconforming structures. This thermometer is one way to represent a community's progress toward a goal. If a community's goals for their lake includes that it is fishable, swimmable, and has clear water, then regulations, including shoreland zoning, can help them move toward their goal. Other tools are needed to achieve their lake goals. In 1968, based on the Water Resource Act passed by the Wisconsin Legislature, the state of Wisconsin set minimum shoreland zoning standards. 
counties were allowed to adopt higher standards if they chose. From 1968 to 2015, at least 43 counties adopted higher shoreland zoning standards for some or all of their lakes and streams. Counties typically adopted higher standards for the lakes and streams most sensitive to development, like small lakes and trout streams, while keeping the state minimum standards for their large lakes and flowages. In 2015, the Wisconsin Legislature passed Act 55, stating counties can no longer have shoreland zoning standards that are more restrictive or higher than the state standards for any of their lakes and streams. Act 55 also said setback averaging is required so structures can be built closer to the water, some impervious surfaces would no longer be counted toward the standard, and all non-conforming structures may be rebuilt at their current location and expanded up to 35 feet in height without shoreland zoning approval, fee, or mitigation. In 2016, the Wisconsin Legislature made further changes to shoreland zoning allowing higher levels of impervious surfaces in more areas, allowing more structures close to the water to be rebuilt in their same location, and allowing structures built close to the water by variance to be expanded up to a height of 35 feet with no shoreland approval, fee, or mitigation. Let's take a minute to review some of the high points presented in these three short videos. We know from many scientific studies that the quality of a lake or river depends on what's happening on the land around it. We know that trees, shrubs, and native plants hold soil in place. When they're removed, there is more erosion that causes algae to grow and the water to be less clear, which results in lower waterfront property values. We also know that shoreland zoning can be a an effective tool to protect lake health and fisheries. Whether shoreland zoning is effective depends on the specifics. How large are the waterfront lots and how large are the shoreline buffers that filter runoff and provide habitat for birds and other wildlife? The larger these are, the more effective shoreland zoning is. How far are buildings and other hard surfaces that cause runoff set back from the water? The research has found that the closer they are to the water, the more impact they have on the lake or river. Shoreland zoning has a long history in Wisconsin. From 1968 until 2015, the state set minimum shoreland standards, and counties could set higher standards, tailored to their local lakes and streams. At least 43 counties adopted higher standards for some or all of their waters. In July of 2015, the Wisconsin Legislature set one-size-fits-all shoreland standards statewide. This means that the state minimum standards also became the state maximum standards. Counties are no longer allowed to have higher standards, such as larger lot sizes, setbacks from the water, or buffers. Waterfront property owners have a great responsibility for, and also a great investment in, a healthy future for Wisconsin lakes and rivers. Working together, we can preserve our legacy by protecting our shoreland areas. Each one of us, from the subdivision developer to the lakefront property owner to the recreational lake user, has an impact and an opportunity to help protect the future economy and quality of life in Wisconsin. Thank you for joining me for this shoreland zoning update. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, Lynn Markham, at the email shown below.